Okay, so welcome everybody um, to Digital Live. Um, discussion in this series is centered on workflow, um, incorporating digital media into your live performance. My name is Callie Chapman, Director of Studio 550, and I'm here with Stephen Petrilli, David Bengali, and Christopher Knapka to discuss, as I said, workflows and integrating media into the live performance. So before we start, I just wanted to give a little bit of time to let the panelists introduce themselves and a little bit about like what their experience is incorporating digital media in some way and in general what do they do so um to start us off can we have steven tell us a little bit about what you do and okay i'm a theatrical lighting designer uh and often stage manager um and I've been lighting dance and uh, theater in the Boston area and New York for decades. Um, uh, I, I don't do video per se, but I'm often involved in shows that have video. So I need to be able to um, uh, integrate the lighting with the video and make sure I'm not in their way and uh, uh, make sure the aesthetic um, relationship between uh, uh, the performer and the video background um, are what we want them to be. And otherwise, I try to stay out of trouble. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Stephen. So next, I'm going to just tag uh, David. Hi, I'm David Bengali, um, a projection designer and content creator. So. Um, a lot of, I'd say most of the work that I do is in live performance in um, traditional theatrical settings. So theater, dance, opera, Broadway, off-Broadway, regional theater. Um, and I also do sometimes some more experimental or immersive performance work. Uh, and I also do content creation and filmmaking for um, digital or broadcast or uh, uh, sort of non-live formats. Awesome. Thank you, David and Chris. Hey, how you doing? I'm Chris Rickenopka, and I'm a video artist. I work primarily in the analog realm, but I also dabble with digital media as well. Um, a lot of what I do is either in live performance or experimental performances uh, where I work with artists one-on-one -on -one to define what their aesthetic is and work relatively closely with them to design that. And then at the same time, I'm a creative technologist where I try to merge experimental technology with video and try to integrate that into new forms of performances. Awesome. So, um, so I want to start with kind of like a basic overview, just in case anyone's questioning what we're talking about is, is like, how do you think of the word workflow in terms of setting up a, and this is for the whole group, like setting up a performance, um, yeah. So how do you think of the word workflow and setting some sort of live performance? Anyone? <laughs> I mean, I'll go, I'll go first. Okay. Um, with workflow, I mean, there's different ways I, I think about it, I guess, in a live performance setting uh, for myself. Whenever I'm doing a performance, the workflow would really be based on if one, I'm doing it by myself, if I'm doing just like video performance by myself, my workflow is make sure like everything is prepared ahead of time, make sure everything is architected ahead of time, what my workflow are with, with the media that I want and then communicating with the artists throughout that process. Um, that's really essential for my workflow to be successful. And that might even be, hey, I set up and then I go talk to the artist beforehand, uh, even before the performance and during the performance, like what do you need color wise, lighting wise, all that just to be very one on one. Um, but then if I'm working on a larger project, sometimes that workflow is more based on like developing an architecture that we can design within because it's very easy to, you know, if you're working with blue sky all the time, it can be very quickly, you can spiral out in these ideas and you don't really get anything 
going. And that, I mean, that's just a common thing with anyone, including myself, who's very creative, that, you know, you want all these dreams. And then at the same time, we have to think like what's realistic within a time frame and developing a workflow within that time frame, which again, that can be daunting uh, for some people, even myself occasionally, but I feel like it's very essential. And whenever I work on a project, I try to bring that into place to say like, if we want this to really succeed, let's look at what your dream is and then let's kind of frame it out like what's attainable in that time frame and then it, it, at least that's how I would view as a workflow to work with someone especially in live performance that preparation is so essential uh, for at least myself to reduce stress so I can be more creative on them in the moment but also creative problem solve when you need to help the person get to their best performance setting I really like um, uh, Christopher what you said about architecture. I think in terms of workflow, I think that that's a really um, pithy way of putting it. That uh, when you can create some kind of a structure that you have all these creative ideas and they could be anything, if you can create a kind of structure within which they will happen and the execution of them will happen, then you kind of know from moment to moment. Okay, what do we need to do next? Uh, uh, and I think there are, to me, there are parts of the workflow that happen that are kind of invisible to anyone who's outside of my department. And they're about how like I get my work done and how the people who are working with me um, within the world of projection or media accomplish all the things that then appear on stage. And to everyone on stage, it's like, oh, that's magic, that just happened. But we've like come up with procedures so that when we need to make a revision or we need to make the next scene, We've, we're like, okay, we know what the steps are that we're gonna go through to do that, even though the ideas are different each time. And then there's the other half of the workflow, which is like the connection to everybody else. So it's, you know, how does an idea that came from an early creative meeting make its way through storyboarding, rehearsals, revisions, tech, audience can see it. How do we work between departments? So, you know, if, if, if lighting and projection are, um, going to relate to each other creatively. What does that mean about how we're going to talk about things like color and um, narrative tools? And are we going to link these tools together in the theater using various kinds of technology so that you know one person can press one button and it can create a number of different things across lighting, sound, and video happening in a kind of unified way? Well put. <laughs> Yeah. Steven. Yeah. I know you're well, you're the odd duck out, but yeah, I am. <laughs> but you're not uh, though. Uh, <laughs> because you're really <laughs> my my workflow tends to be different from these two guys, uh, mm -hmm. because they are more in the realm of creative artists and I'm more in the realm of an interpretive artist. So I'm I'm reacting to what else is happening and lighting accordingly rather than um, uh, generating and conceptualizing, uh, which is what, you know, the choreographers, directors, playwrights, uh, you know, scene designers and video designers do a lot more than I do. And I, I try to take a back seat um, uh, and react to what the circumstances and what the needs are, uh, rather than uh, uh, conceptions of what the work is going to be. So that's my cop out. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wonder if as a lighting designer, you, you say you take a back seat, but there's also this play of like sharing in, in the physical realm of like when you're designing a show and they have to, you know, there's a projection in the show and the projector has to go somewhere and you're sharing this light aspect because everything is light on the stage. Like, how do you, you know, play with that? In, okay. In um, well, I, in, in terms of what the light itself is doing, uh, job one is 
not to get light on the projection screens, uh, on the projection surfaces. Um, because light is, you know, since projection is basically light anyway, uh, if I add light to that, I'm, I'm pretty much providing an eraser. And they love that. Um, so my, uh, my task is to keep light on the performer and off of whatever is uh, being affected by projection. Um, so I, I, I do have to keep a close eye on where projectors are and, and uh, what they're aiming at. And how do, I, how do I keep light off of their surfaces? And sometimes, uh, uh, as in with the birds, uh, Conference of the Birds that David and I did and you and I did, um, how, how I can disguise how I'm keeping light off of um, projection surfaces. Uh, the side light, uh, I used uh, an awful lot of um, uh, gobos, which are patterns in the light. So uh, light was coming out kind of in vertical stripes from the side. Uh, and I would align those vertical stripes with the screen so that the shadows in between the vertical stripes are what was hitting the screen. Uh, so it, it's, uh, you know, I would have had shadows on that screen anyway, but a field full of light with one shadow for the screen would not have worked. You know, it would have been too apparent. So that's why I filled it with shadows. So it looked uh, camouflage. Mm -hmm. Cool. I had no idea about this piece of the process and, and Stephen and I have been working on this show and, and Callie worked on it with us as well. We, we've been doing this for yeah. like three years now. And this is like a really cool thing to find out about. Um, oh, it's it's one of my there. favorite things to do on that yeah. show. <laughs> <laughs> cool. To, to make it look like I'm not doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's very seamless. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Callie, can you show a, a shot? Uh, the birds, you know, the bird shot. No, no, not that one. The different point to make with that. There you go. So this this is uh, David's projection behind it and uh, uh, Anakaya Dance Theater. Um, I'm lighting the uh, two performers in front of the screen. There's no light on the screen at all, except for what David provides. Um, easy enough to do in isolation, tough to do on a full stage, but you know, so those are the tricks. How do you go about, and I don't mean to cut off yet, if you have something else to bring up, but uh, I'm curious. I don't, about, I don't know. <laughs> like, how do you go about prototyping some like lighting concepts like that? Because it, it'd be difficult without seeing a full stage you know, and if you don't have that setup, is it that you've essentially done this so much you can just see it in your head how it would react like different lighting and angles, or do you have a space that you like work in? Um, no, I, I, I I've done it enough. I mean, I know I know the um, well. In this case, I know the screens are parallel to, or perpendicular to the center line, so I know it's directly left to right, mm -hmm. uh, which makes it easy because it's predictable. Right, and as the side light tends to be directly left and right. Um, it's also easy enough to slice off. Uh, the show I met David on in Iowa, uh, it, it had uh, screen, uh, projection panels that rotated. And so, you know, if something's like this and gets a projection, then I have a different lighting mm -hmm. um, problem that, I don't want to say problem to solve, but a uh, different lighting circumstance to deal with. Right. Uh, and uh, I know on that one uh, out in Iowa is like an awful lot of trial and error and a lot of um, uh, solutions on the fly. I mean, sounds like a challenging thing to just yeah. have happen. Had, had, I, had I known... Um, uh, ahead of time, more specifically, how the scenery was going to behave, um, that would have been easier. Um, but I didn't. 
and you know so i i drank more coffee and got a little less sleep this is actually an interesting point though about Christopher, what you're saying about prototyping and Stephen, what you're saying about if only we had known more in, upfront about how the scenery is going to work. Like, I think that this sort of workflow question, this is a big part of it. And um, it's one of the big challenges in producing live theater, particularly in the US where technical development periods are the thing we get the least of much of the time, um, as opposed to other parts of the world where like that's more frequently something that can be part of like time and funding that uh, sometimes when we get to tech, that's like the first time we're actually putting all these different elements together. And that's right. really way too late to, to find out some of these things. Um, and so I don't know, like part of the workflow is figuring out like, well, what can we do to try to get closer to knowing what's gonna happen? Um, and that's one of the reasons I like working in projection. I used to be mostly a lighting designer and I've shifted now to mostly projection. One of the things I, I feel kind of safer about is that we get to storyboard things like when we make content, or at least you should storyboard things if possible. So uh, in other words, like if you, if you have an image of the set, a photo of the set model or a 3D model or whatever, you can lay content into that as you're building it and share it with people. So they're like, oh, I can really see what this is really gonna look like. And then when you first walk into tech, they're like, oh, we've sort of seen the whole show. We know what the first cue is. That's very challenging with lighting um, to do in any way that is, is like feels really real. Like there's, you know, previs systems out there, but the, a lot of them look kind of deadly compared to like what real life is going to look like. like WYSIWYG? Um, yeah, exactly. Like they're great sort of technical tools, but they're not necessarily a thing you want to share in like a creative meeting with a choreographer and be like, this is really what it's going to look like because <laughs> it's like the plastic model version of it. Um, and I guess, you know, one thing that I try to advocate for a lot is like, okay, we, we're not gonna get to have tech before tech, but are there things that we can try? Like, can we do a little mini workshop of something? And when someone says like, which fabric should we use? And they send me a two inch thing. I'm like, I have no idea. Can we get a rehearsal room for two days or a day or four hours and like bring six foot pieces of the three different fabric choices and like get a little projector and bring a light and like have a performer, then we can save thousands of dollars of rebuilding the set in tech because we found out in two hours like this fabric is not going to work or look at this magical thing we can do if we put this person in between these two things yeah i i mean i just feel like in theater even in like when i perform with musicians or worked with artists for like museum events like i i feel like it's a systemic thing that happens um like i get it in myself too like when i've created um installations like you have a certain you, you generally know what's going to happen but you know when you're in the space and actually putting it together it, things start to occur that you may not have foreseen or even if you planned everything something's going to go sideways regardless and and especially in my experience with doing a lot of experimental technology like there is no there's no stable there's just figure it out. And if it works at night, it works. If it's failing, you just have to kind of go with it and not, not overemphasize the failure of it. And which I've done that many a times. I did a performance uh, at Berkeley with the professor at the time where we had eight computers on stage and they're all synced together. And at one point, like one of them's failing, but that's like part of the composition. But we had someone else just like ready to go kind of bring up other sounds to, you know, perform like it's actually part of it. And you're just winging it the whole time. But as you start to increase this complexity, like you're saying with, you know, trying to sync, you know, lighting cues and then talking to, you know, everyone organizing and getting it together. It's difficult unless you have all the steps and especially tech early on synced up during storyboarding or any type of creative phase, because the more you kind of leave that out, the more chance, like you said, like you can lose thousands of dollars in just daily of, oh, this is not the way we thought it was going to be. We didn't really see the space. We just guessed the space. And I feel like that happens a fair amount. And that's where like this type of workflow, you know, if you can get prototyping in like you were saying, you know, let's get a rehearsal room and like, let's just try these things. Doing that is so foundational for everything. Uh, I kind of wish I saw more with it where it's just like, we have template systems. Like we've understood that we've done this with all these fabrics. This is what it looks like. And maybe that's too looking ahead or technical, but 
those type of tools are what's going to save you years later and lots of time and actually make your process so much more efficient. Interesting. It's like layering complexity because like having a person, just one performer on stage in the dark, right? That's already complex. <laughs> then you add a light. <laughs> right. <laughs> and then you add some sound. And then you add audience and then you add in then the further you layer each component each component has its own complexity that's in you know integrating into your environment and then how can you possibly when a computer has so many parts that could go wrong at any one time like that just is this layer of complexity that's a little bit like now you just have to do a risk assessment if you can if you can <laughs> um <laughs> because who knows someone's going to jiggle the wire and then nothing will happen because it's a one or a zero i think the uh the environment i work in normally is uh, a little less sophisticated than the environment david works in so when he talks about getting you know like one system that would uh, integrate uh, on a you know a, a queuing system uh you know using q lab to fire everything um you know, video and sound and lighting cues. Um, I'm distrustful of those things. Um, uh, so, uh, but, you know, in David's environment, he's working with, uh, with people who have more expertise on the equipment. So it's a little easier to be confident there. I'll say it's also because of necessity in, in a lot of theatrical production, um, there is no video operator because for various reasons. I mean, it's really financial. Like right. lots of companies will say, well, why should we pay a person to sit there and press the space bar when there's already someone else who's sitting there pressing a button all night long? If we just link these things together, we pay one less person. And there's a whole lot of things to say there, of course, about labor and valuing people and all of that. But regardless of what one may think about that, that's just the reality that, like, I generally don't get a person who can be the person who presses the button for my design. So I'm always dependent on, or much of the time I'm dependent on another department um, to run, to make my ideas happen in time. Um, and there's sometimes there's a choice to make there, like, well, if, if we can say all the video cues are gonna be tied to a lighting cue, or all the video cues are going to be tied to a sound cue. Like, let's say we're not putting all three together. What makes more sense for a particular show? Um, and the answer could be conceptual. Like, it could be that, like, maybe on a particular show, the video is really closely tied to the music, and the lighting is really closely tied to staging performance, and the performance doesn't always line up with the music. Then it would be really difficult for, you know, the stage manager to call lighting cues that need to shift around if then there's these other cues that need to work in time every night. So in that case, we might like to sound. But on, another, on a different show, it might be the case that like lighting and video shift at the same time all the time because they're both part of the same kind of Environment. storytelling. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's also sort of more traditionally the case that there are more lighting cues than sound cues and that they follow a kind of architectural structure that's often more similar to how video cues work. And it's like an electrics department. And as Callie was saying, like it's about light. And so that's, I find it more frequently the case that projection is linked to lighting. And when we all leave, when but we meaning like the designers and the people who loaded in the show, the folks who are left to make it all keep going, it's often the case that someone in lighting is told like, well, it is now your job to also be responsible for projection. Um, and I think that that's often, that's often a thing that, that happens as well is that this sort of question about is this a show that is going to happen over a short period of time? And so all the people who made it are the same people who are going to keep it going. Or is it going to happen for a long enough period of time, either because it's going to tour or it's going to run for a month or open ended or it's going to be a museum or whatever, that you have to figure out how to take all your stuff and hand it off to people who may have varying degrees of experience in whatever this technology is um, and you need to a get them on board and sort of understand your intention and like also educate them in terms of the pieces they need to know and what to do about like the pieces that they're not going to know because 
it may be impossible to learn how to like rebuild the whole thing from scratch. <laughs> like if that were possible, we'd all be out of a job, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Christopher, I'm curious for you in that process. I mean, it sounds like the, the work that you do, like, so, I mean, the work that Stephen and I do, I think maybe more often falls into a template where people see it and they're like, well, we haven't seen this show before, but we've seen this kind of setup before. And it sounds like the work you do is like often each time is a completely new thing. Um, so how does that process work for you in terms of handing it off to someone um, uh, and making sure that it's gonna keep doing the thing that it needs to do? It's, um, yeah, like, it's interesting, because sometimes if I work with the same artist, so like, I, I work with this artist, Sonona Hendrix, whenever we do a performance, it's very much the same thing. It's like, come here, bring the analog setups with the analog synthesizer, so Steve and I can understand the reason of why you wouldn't want to work with computers, it's just not reliable, that's why I do a lot of my visuals all analog, um, for that reasoning. <laughs> um, it's very stable, they will not break. Um, you need converters and everything, but you know, you go to a show and you have older gear, you actually get a lot more respect from a lot of the video people and you can get some ins, which is always very nice too. Um, that's helped a lot getting to different venues, but that's a side point to it. But going back to it, yeah, often it's not template. It There has to be a lot of like research and discovery to start where it's like inner, like pretty much interviewing the artists of like, what do you need to do? What do you want to do? What are your technological things you want to do? What are, you know, everything from color, theme, all that, and then really trying to help them bring that out in a tangible way and, and know either whether it's software or hardware that we need or even concepts or people I need to connect with to then enable that dream. The hard part becomes when, you know, certain people may, you know, be very fixated on something they want, but then you have to then kind of bring the reality there. And that becomes very challenging sometimes, depending on what group you're working with or what they expect. Cause you know, a good example is, you know, you, you watch a TV show and they see someone touch a screen and like, Oh, it's, you know, we can make this, projection and they can touch it and and it moves along with what we touch and it's like actually that's very complicated and I have to explain that technically break it down and be like so that's how it works this is what it takes and sometimes that's very hard for people to want to get into that like technical mode but as someone like that does technical things but is also does a lot of creative uh, improv skills and like all these different things my background I went to music school I studied sound design and jazz composition so I take that kind of being able to improvisize and then add it to the technical to try to bring out that idea but that can be for some individuals it's just a little more challenging to kind of and, and I think it's for anyone who has a very specific dream it's hard to pull it out of your head. You have to do a lot of different things to describe it, to bring it out exactly what you want. And a lot of the interpretation phase is where I try to develop that workflow with them of a, a kind of call and response of like, this is the research, I'll do it, I'll bring it to you, this is the reality. Now let's start to build it. And as we build it, we go through phases of like, this is the prototype, how do you feel? Does this fit what you want? And just continually do that until we get to some type of stable point where we know, okay, this interaction we built, this installation for whatever that was proposed, whether it's projection or creative technology, that stabilized, then it's more of, in a lot of cases when, for example, I'll do like feedback installations is then you really get detailed on the usability of it. Like how is the audience interacting with it? What's their perception of it? And really trying to then match that with what was created. So you don't make something that's overly complicated. So for example, I did a installation at the Children's Museum and I worked with an artist uh, to develop this idea using a leap motion, which is a hand controller. But what they wanted to do is embed it in some type of like artificial grass. So when like you moved your hand, like touching the grass, it would move a video around them that's projected in the room so as they're moving their hand they're like moving the forest and but you have to think like yeah you put it there but now lighting's a factor they didn't think about that the room's a factor based on the size how we're doing the projection the internet's a factor now you're talking you know 
can people go up to it and knock over this thing? Like how sensitive is it, even the technology itself? Like there comes into play these all these other things and nuances that you can only understand once it's in the moment. And that's where it gets really interesting because this type of creative problem solving gets very essential in the workflow that you, you have to compromise. Like that's an inevitability. And that is something that, at least in my field, like I've had to learn very early on that if you just want to succeed with it, like if you develop the framework, you know, or have a baseline of like what your success can be there. And then as you're putting it into the space, you can evaluate like, is this like what I defined? Is that success? Because if, if you just think I'm going to put it in a space with no real like baseline, like it will work, do all that, then that can ruin the expectations of the artists or the gallery or whoever. It's like that continual reevaluation is part of the process for me. And by doing that and keeping the close contact, um, whether it's with people I'm working with to achieve it or myself, by being so like within and hands on throughout that process, I, be I gain more confidence that the people around me are going to succeed in what they do because I'm being so thorough as much. It may be annoying for some people that I'm so thorough or, you know, um, I just think it's essential. So if you build that confidence in them, they're going to want to succeed with you and they see you doing it. They're going to continue with you as well. And sometimes that can be challenging with bigger shows guarantee, like bigger teams. It's challenging. Um, there are those compromises that happen like technologically. And that's where, again, like working with the artist so one-on-one -on -one from the beginning that helps in the gallery or wherever it's going, that then allows you to, for me at least, remove that stress level if there's issues on the day of performance or anything, because you know that like you've provided that expectation all the way through of what's going to happen, how it was built. They know. So even the gallery people feel like, oh, wow, I knew how that was built. I know what it's doing. And they can express that to people coming in. Then the people you work with can articulate it too. And I've done that when I've ever I've done that, I've actually gotten a lot more callbacks or a lot more, you know, connections that way because just showing up and willing to go all in, it, it, it makes it easy for everyone else. And I guess that's the big thing I try to do whenever I do a performance. And I mean, Callie knows whenever I show up to a show, it's like, no one has to think about me. I have all my stuff set up, table, plug in, ready to go. I'm done in 15 minutes and I'm just waiting for the show now because I know that I did everything I could do to get to the best level of success. And again, that may be in, intense or like a, a certain flow for some people, but the more we think about that with each other's and ourselves, the more we can like enable ourselves to do the best work we can. Yeah, agreed. Um, I had, th that made me think about something and it had to do with I think both scale. So like working within a scale of a certain size of a team of equipment of a performance space and, and scale of time as well. So like, how do you think about scale when you're trying to, you know, maybe be the, the bearer of bad news that no, you're not going to build a set in three hours, like that's not going to happen, you know, <laughs> or something to that effect of like being in communication with the artist or the director or the whoever's leading the production and being realistic in here are your parameters. We can do this within those parameters if we had, you know, more time, more space, we could do this, you know, like, how do we think about mitigating risk, I guess, is that because you could just like, yeah, we can build a set three hours and then do it. And then it's going to look like crap, <laughs> but may look good. There may be a point where it could look good. Who knows? You know, it's like all those risk things. Like, how do we think of like, how do you in your practice think about that or articulate that in some ways? I don't know. Like that's like a million dollar question. <laughs> I know. Like right. we're every project is about like the dreams are bigger than the resources. Like that's of also course. just what making yeah. art means. Um, but I mean, I think one thing, Kelly, I like the way that you put it. In fact, or in, in instead of saying we can't do this, it's like here's what we can do in these resources, and like that's a part of it. In terms of the communi communication part, I think it's always great to be like here's what is possible 
rather than here's here's the 50 million or the infinite things that aren't possible. Um, and sometimes, I don't know, I don't know, I feel 50-50 on whether I think this is true, but um, sometimes restrictions can make things better because when you're forced to work within particular parameters, they can give you structure, like, you know, writing a Shakespearean sonnet like, or a haiku or something. And, you know, if you have, if you're like, we know that we get, a, to, the show has to be 30 minutes long. Like, what ideas can you fit in 30 minutes? What do you need to cut so that that's the best 30 minutes you can have? I, find, I think it's rarely the case that when tech is short, anyone's ever going to be like, this is so great. It's helping us be structured. <laughs> um, you always want more time to like put the stuff together. Um, and I think one of the things I would say is like when time is limited, it's, and Steven's, you know, the best at this is like starting from the end point to talk about like, well, what are the things that they, that have to happen in order for this to be watchable? And what are the things that have to happen that some departments may not have thought of that other departments need? Like, yeah, we have to load in this whole show, but if the dancers have never performed on this scenery, then how much time do they need with just work light and nobody doing technical things to be safe and adjust the choreography to this new three-dimensional environment? Like that is gonna be the most important thing. And okay, if that's gonna take six hours, then let's start by saying, okay, now let's put that six hours into the schedule. Now let's work back before that. What's the next thing that like has to happen? And then eventually you get to like, okay, well, we figured out, we now have the time for all the things that must happen. What time is left? How do we want to use it? Yeah. Like, um, and that's where the sort of flexibility comes in. We're like, well, we could do this or we could try this other thing. Or like, if we have extra time, let's have other things on the list because then we can pick which one is the most exciting to do that we may or may not get to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, start start with your end state and work backwards. Exactly. Yeah, that, I, I definitely feel that same way. Like, if you can do that, then everything's going to work. <laughs> Ideally. There was something else that came to mind. Now I forgot what it was. I forgot. Oh, here's this story time. Um, think of a time in which, and you don't have to name names if you don't want to, that's fine, or, or just be very vague. Um, think of a time in which a show really, really worked well. And, and what are the things that created that working well? And sometimes I'm sure that there's like really hard to, you know, fine tune, but like really what stood out in your mind to like, this was actually a good experience for me as whatever role you were doing. And here's where I think why um, that happened. As a generality, my, this isn't exactly the question, but, uh, uh, my favorite stories are ones that involve work that really inspires me. Um, and, you know, how, uh, the, the details of what works and doesn't work uh, are secondary. But, you know, inspirational in, in whatever fashion that is, whether it's emotional or um, um uh just aesthetic or energy or whatever um though those are the ones that stick out as my favorite shows whether you know the lighting accomplished what it set out to accomplish is like uh a little background I guess I have a couple of shows in mind that I think uh, the common thread in them being, I think, successful, at least successful as a process, and I think successful as a product, were cases where there's tight integration, creative integration between all of the different departments and the kind of boundaries between 
who is allowed to have an opinion on what are very fuzzy. I think that it's like the audience is not like, I don't think the audience is coming to the show to be like, let me figure out what the lighting designer's ideas were and let me figure out what the ideas that were that came from the writer. Like they're trying to watch a kind of, you know, complete experience um, and not think about all the different pieces separately from each other. And so I think often when we kind of can create in the same way and like, you know, you know, if, you know, the costume designer can come and say, I have this projection idea, or if I can say, you know, I have a thought about the writing in this scene that, you know, then when we get to the, in the room por portion of it, um, everybody's there to solve problems together and the problems get solved or the challenges get solved or the story gets told in ways where all of the elements kind of synthesize with each other, as opposed to like everybody in the dark with their headset on, like solving their own version of the experience. <laughs> And then you're watching like eight different shows at once. Um, but I think it's often challenging because it's not always clear to any given person whether another person's at a point in their process where it, they're ready to, to, to take in information. Um, and, you know, like for, for the projection designers, it is often the case that we come in, and we, like we were saying before, like we have a pile of stuff um, and now's our chance to start making it into new stuff. For the lighting designer, like you don't really get your tools until the first time you sit down in the chair. And if someone comes over to you and you write your first light cue and they're like, what if that were, what if that were a different color? Is it gonna look like that? Or like I like turn it on for the first time. I <laughs> like I need a second. Yeah, the the stories that are the opposite of Callie's question come much more readily to mind. Yeah, for myself, uh, just in terms of memorable experiences, it's it's tough because um, a lot of shows that I've done with a lot of projection, even going to like, for example, like the analog stuff I do is not hdmi a lot of times just a little more atypical of what you're going to get at like a venue so i usually have to work with uh like the house projection to set that up ahead of time which is fine if that can always work out that's like the best case scenario and things like glide pretty smoothly but when i i think for me the more memorable ones is like for example i did this show in jamaica plain and we were doing it in a church and so somehow a month or so before I did a show and I got two Christie movie projectors and I was like, all right, I'm putting these in the rafters and I'm going to set this up. And so I can light up the whole church, but lo and behold, I'm the only one doing it. And I'm having to lug 50 pound projectors all the way up to the balconies and then setting them up on custom mounts and all that, that I made. And it was fine once I set it up, but it's just the coordination of all that was annoying, but the reward of it, was significantly worth all the time I did for it. Going to shows that like when I perform for like in New York or something where I just kind of show up and I can plug in and, and I'm ready to go. Like those are enjoyable because they're like pretty streamlined and it just feels like a good professional flow. But the, to me, at least for myself, like some of the best shows I've ever had were, you know, fully trying to put it all together like that. And then if I can work with the artists, that's great. If not, a lot of times I'll just show up and it's full improvisation the whole time. And a lot of the analog shows I've done have been that. So I think it's like a mix of having somewhat structure and knowing like what the framework of, you know, these projections I want to set up is, but then opening up the case and be like, all right, my brain is gone now. And now I can just do, just like listen to what the person's doing and be fully reactive to it. So it becomes more counterpoint. And oddly enough, a lot of times after shows, people are like, how'd you sync that up? I'm like, there's no sync. This is <laughs> me just doing this. Cause that's more how I guess I interpret it is like the brain wants to complete it. So let the brain complete it. Why should I always usher the completion when they, you know, it becomes more organic for them to complete it themselves. There's a certain amount of fun of being able to pull a rabbit out of a hat. Yep. Unexpectedly. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And that, that was like another comment on chance and 
risk and <laughs> all the rest of it, I guess, right? Um, Performance is risk and it's mm -hmm. chance all in one. Mm -hmm. I think I want to take a little bit of a, a look and see if anybody in our Zoom chat session has any questions and you can either do that in the chat if you don't want to be on screen and I can read that for you or you can pop your head out of your boxes <laughs> and ask the question yourself. Um, can anybody have anything? Um, just I, how about I'll give you like five minutes to think about it. And if you do have a question, just put, put your raise your hand or put something in the chat and I can call on you. Um, so I said that. I want to go into the realm of like thinking about media and how it it's, it's I think I said this on last session we had last week in the workshop session um there was something brought up about technology and how technology is like this special thing but at one point I was like but light was special at a point like at light was a thing that we incorporated all of a sudden it wasn't flame and candles it was some electrical things that were on stage and that was technology at that point and we've gotten really good at it like removing that stigma of like this is a thing that we have to you know it's different than real life and it was like no it's just augmentation of real life right and it's and that tool. it's another tool exactly another and like tool and and you know certain people are going to get more comfortable using them um and integrating the, that tool into you know whatever work is being done yeah, it's all technology, right? Like hitting a rock with another rock is technology. Yeah. So I guess maybe, you know, what people mean when they say technology is they mean computers, but computers are not new in the theater either. They've been in the, so it's like, there's, all, there's only something that people perceive as like the thing that's different now. And if you actually investigate it, it turns out that thing has been there for longer than you think. And like projection and projecting media onto stage and onto people is, you know, it's very old. It's yeah. people have been doing this Nikolai since. Nikolai was doing that in the fifties. Yeah, like, but it's like hundreds of years. Like, th this is one of the things I always tell my students is like, you can go back and find really cool projection-based performances from literally the like seventeenth century with like backlit scrims and projection on fog and like all these things that people would say now, like that sounds really hard. It's gonna take us a lot of tech time. You're like, probably, but it's also, people have been doing it for hundreds of years. So I think the thing that's different now is, or that's currently, you know, different is the size of technology. Like everybody can access a computer in their pocket right now in this conversation, probably. Everybody can make media media comes from lots of different places and the sort of quantity of it that we're surrounded by is huge and the sort of range of available finances to make that stuff is really wide ranging and so at the moment if someone goes to see a performance somewhere that person could just have watched like a you know giant budget blockbuster marvel movie and you may or may not have resources that match that in what you're doing. So like, what are you doing with technology that's interesting? What are you doing with media that's interesting and specific? Um, and how do you take into account the fact that people are surrounded by these things? And it's like, it's what they're breathing on, like, you know, the top of a cab or the side of a bus now. I think uh, MTV did uh, Modern Dance a great disservice. Um, as uh, you know, MTV video, well, music videos in the early 80s uh, were such that modern dance choreographers a lot of times wanted to um, replicate that, not having the wherewithal to. So I think 
technology's probably caught up to what that was doing. <laughs> mm. Maybe, but I, I saw I showed a video of like Cunningham and Nam June last week, and I think the participants and the, they were like, "Wow, that was kind of advanced." And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, guess, "I guess it was at the time. It was like lots of wires, <laughs> not so much as like a camera you push. You know, like it doesn't just green screen automatically. Like, it was kind of advanced." But it was like comparing '70s stuff with current things that we actually have access to was like kind of mind blowing and looking at them both. Um, the same time. Um, we did have a question in the chat asking, I will read it. Um, how to best budget and begin planning for long term project collaboration with a choreographer, projection design, lighting design. Mm -hmm. um, thinking about interactive installation and an alternative public space. I'm just throw that out there. <laughs> I guess I to clarify the question a little bit. I, I I'm curious whether you're wondering about like there's budgeting the thing that's actually going to happen, like budgeting for the installation and performance, and then there's the budgeting for like the whole process of making that happen, um, which I think are really two very separate budgets um and the budget for the actual thing is often hard to determine until you've done some work that requires its own money which is coming up with what the thing is and all that like prototyping creative time um re residencies like all of that stuff so yeah i mean is it is i guess yeah is it okay to ask that clarification question like is is this sort of about both of those halves or is it about one half or the other half specifically The first being the sorry, with the first being the like pre the prep period or the um the production period development. Yeah, cool. Um, I think we will probably all have different answers, but I guess one thing that I will say is like I do a lot of work where um they're very long term projects with a sort of either a known endpoint that's far away or the endpoint we don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and then I do other projects where it's like we have a very specific schedule. It's going to start work at this point and end at this point, and this is the show. For the longer term things, um, I've, I guess I have two thoughts. One is that it can become very easy for the cost of people's time to become dissociated from the amount of time that needs to be spent and the funding available for that. Um, and as creative artists, often we're all ready to just be like, we just want to make this good. We're going to keep working on it. But then when you're faced with like a lot of different projects and you have to decide like, how much time can I put into this? If there's one project where it's like, you get paid $300 and it's two years of work, it's, you sort of have to be careful about whether that's like, what is that? Is that really what you're up to? And is that sustainable? Um, and so I think that's one thing is like, think about how much time you actually need people to be working on things. And in an ideal world, think about like, what should someone's hourly or daily wage be um, and multiply that out. And this is a this conversation, like it almost never happens in kind of long term arts projects, particularly like fund grant driven or nonprofit projects. But I think it's really important. I think particularly that during the pandemic, when lots of projects have been expanding and like shifting gears because live performance had to become something else, I've become much more aware of this. Um, and thinking like we should all just be take care of each other and take care of ourselves in that way and sometimes it just means saying like we still want to do this but we have to raise the money to pay people a living wage for development work um and then the, the second thing that i'll say is sometimes that's not always possible like you can't just say well we have this project and therefore we're going to like bring on full-time employees for three years because that's not how the funding works and so there are a lot of projects i work on where the solution to that ends up being like a grant residency cycle based development where we say okay here's a particular task we want to do we want to come up with the script or we want to we want to prototype the the interactive phone app and try that out and like making things bite sized and say this is the thing we want to accomplish 
how much, how much time do we need? We need three weeks. We need three weeks with two people. And then we need a third person to be there with us for the third week of that. We can raise this much money. We can do that. And when no one is working on this, we're not going to ask them to like keep working on it outside of that residency. And it can sometimes make the development process get longer. And it, that can be rough because every time you pick up again, it's like, okay, where were we? What were we doing? <laughs> but I think it can be a lot more equitable that way. Um, and it allows people to really dedicate themselves during that period of time because then they go away and they do their other work and they're not like stressed like, oh my God, this is three years and I'm not making any money. I can't really work on it. Um, and it protects the people who are gonna just work on it regardless of whether they're being paid for it, <laughs> which is like, so you have to do both of those things like protect people and care for people. Um, uh, yeah, and there's like a project I'm working on right now where that's exactly what's been happening. And uh, it, it sort of works the other way around where we're like the, 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 the grant, the people who are most into the grant side of it, they'll be like, we got this much money. And they'll come to us, the designers and say, we can give you this much. We would, they, and they first, they say, we wanna pay you this much out of it. So set that aside. You don't get to spend that on other stuff because we need to pay you. With this much left, what can you accomplish? What should we decide that our goals are? Um, and then we're sort of fitting the goals to the resources. So this didn't really answer your question of like, how do you decide how much things cost? But I think these are some ways to think about how do you answer that question for a particular project? I also think it becomes um, a, a back and forth conversation with, you know, your individual collaborators um, in terms of, okay, here's, here's my vision, my framework, my schedule. How do you interrelate with this and what's that worth to you? And is it worth that much to me? Um, and, and it becomes, you know, probably three conversations, you know, with, you know, your video projection designer, your lighting designer, your costume designer, um, uh, as far as how that unfolds. Um, getting into mounting something, uh, in a public space, is this indoor or outdoor? Good, so there's electricity there. Um, uh, uh, if it, it, I'm, I'm assuming it's a non-traditional performance space or a, a, it's not a non-performance space and being done, um, I don't know, in a city hall lobby or something. So um, I think, I think you know, your, your production people need to determine everything that needs to be brought in that you would take for granted would be there if it were a theater. Um, things like electricity or positions, uh, places to hang your lights, um, you know, a means of mounting or securing uh, scenery if you have scenery. Um, a choreographer, um, you know, is there going to be a Marley floor and how's that dealt with? How's, how's, um, the sprung floor or not sprung floor aspect going to be dealt with. So uh, uh, comes a lot of conversations and and um, then it's just math. I I definitely agree like i've shared similar few points with the both of you um it, and especially the this part that you said david about breaking up into small bite-sized pieces i think especially with like complicated you know if you're trying to do an installation outside or indoor doing something that's in a non-traditional space like if you can if times allows like you can create a way to you know break up that development and i think of it this way is like so you can do it in parallel. You have two streams always going. So you have, let's say you're just doing research for one thing and then underneath you're actually taking that and developing, but now it's informing new research going forward. So you can continually keep a feedback loop going, but that's also difficult too, because people uh, who are part of that, everyone has to be locked in. And like you said, uh, the living wage is, is a massive thing when it comes to this stuff and and by breaking it up if possible i think you can you can get to that but it takes a lot of planning to 
you know, and having the either having the money or having grants to line up to ha if you can get that and really plan to have a lot of that done ahead of time, that will alleviate any problems you could have going forward in the development. But I think the best way to approach it is yeah, breaking it up into small sections because you'll get a lot of learnings from that and you may actually find better solutions to what you're doing if you can break it up versus thinking, oh, I have to do all of these things. It becomes, you know, more attainable versus being overwhelmed. Yeah, and I just want to add to that um, a lot of grants that are um, out there, say in the Boston area too, I'm particularly familiar with what that looks like. A lot of the times there's this anticipation of saying, I want to do this project and, and I can get this money to do this project. And I'm gonna do this whole big thing, and we're gonna do this, and, we're gonna, and then it's not really feasible. Like you, if you think about it in in the terms of like, well, if you're only gonna get, and I say only in a very respectful way, but if you if you're only gonna get five thousand dollars to do a project, you have to consider whether or not this is only a portion of a longer journey, or the actual journey itself. And like, how far does that money, how far can it go without subsidy of like either raising funds or depending on some ticket sales, which is not a great, great idea to begin with, but you know, like how far in your creative process can that money actually take you and don't get caught up in the, the sense of, well, I have it now, so I have to use it now and it has to be this big production and it has to be this and it, you know, like that will get you in trouble because in the future, it's not gonna look done with that little money and little time and little resources versus it could be a portion of a longer term project that could be developed over a period of time like David is doing right now very smartly, I'm sure. Um, yeah, that's, that's my two cents. <laughs> I think part of the question is also about like, how do you even plan this stuff? I mean, everyone has different planning procedures and such, but in the spirit of this being like a workflow conversation, um, I'm a big fan of shared documents, structured shared documents. And if and it doesn't matter what the structure is um, or who, who proposes it, but if there's some structure, then there's this place that everybody can organize these questions about like, what are the pieces of this? How do they fit together and who's responsible for each of them? Um, and like, you know, when I, was in, when I was in grad school, they would, you know, they would always have us do scene breakdowns and, um, after I got out of school, I would sort of keep, this is like shows with scripts or things like this. And I would, I would kind of keep doing it for a bit. And then I sort of stopped doing it. I got lazy about it. And now I like do them all the time, but they're a collaborative exercise. And like, I always am, want there to be for whenever there's a show or a project, particularly if it's going to take a long time to do it, I'm like, where's the outline? And if there's like no script or it's not a text-based thing, then I'm really like, where's the outline? Um, <laughs> And it could start as you know a series of drawings in a choreographer's sketchbook. It could start as like a Google sheet with like a very kind of grid based thing where it's like time one way and elements the other, like kind of performance elements the other way, like lighting, sound, interactivity, whatever, like any of those. And it could be one and another that kind of merge together. Um, and the fact that now, you know, in this day and age, multiple people can be in a document at the same time is great because like half of every production now is Zoom meetings and well, right now 100% of every production process. Yeah. But, uh, even before the pandemic, there was so much like distance-based collaboration that when everyone has like their own notebook and they're taking their own notes, it can very quickly be like, what did we actually decide in the last meeting? But if there's a Google Doc up there or whatever that, or a Miro drawing page or something, um, then you're like, okay, we got it. We have the notes. No one had to take any notes because we all put them in as we went. Um, and then when we meet again four weeks from now, we're like, oh, this is where we are. Um, and you see all the blank spaces and you're like, well, that's a thing we haven't solved yet. Let's solve that. Yeah, that's a great comment about just in general communication. <laughs> like if you're working with a team being in communication with your team and your team includes what, you know, like who do they include in, who needs to be looped into what is also an interesting factor to that equation. 
I mean, I feel similar. I mean, shared documents. I've been a big fan of Miro. I don't know if anyone's used that. It's like a collaborative board. It's it's great. I found that actually to be even better um, with people who, you know, there's some visual people who, like visual thinkers, and there's people who want to make lists. Like, it actually brings together different, you know, people's mind patterns. So I feel that's been a lot better for bigger projects, especially for visualizing workflows and, like, kind of getting everyone organized so they can do it in their own way versus I feel sometimes documents can be a little restrictive people trying to get their ideas out depending but I think a mix of those two have been uh, very successful for me do we have any other questions out there hello hello, hello. Everybody. No. I don't want to force it but I just want to make sure that there's there's space for that um, and I want to move on to this uh, this next thing. That's oh, here it is, Emily. Yes, outdoor projection mapping, outdoor installations, and these are good questions. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I guess I'm going to read this. Um, the question was, I'm exploring, experimenting with outdoor installation and projection mapping. I'd appreciate your thoughts on what to keep an eye on or consider for installations outside. <laughs> Power, again. Mm -hmm. Batteries, no. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. so Power is a tricky one because depending on what you're projecting on and where the projectors go, the power may not come from the same place as the people you are dealing with for <laughs> the event. <laughs> and hopefully th they can help you solve that. But like, it may be that you're trying to connect to city power for projection mapping on a private building, or it might be that the projectors need to go, like maybe you can keep the projectors out of the weather if they go inside another building across the street and then so it's like navigating across like different entities and figuring out who can coordinate that. Um, weather is, I mean, weather is the, a huge one, obviously, like outdoors, uh, that's the biggest variable. And um, it's very different when you're talking about something that's going to happen one day only. Um, and it either can or can't happen or something that needs to last over a period of time. Um, and if projectors do need to go outside, if they cannot be protected by being inside a building, then they have to go into some kind of an enclosure. Um, and you should just, if you haven't dealt with projector enclosures before, they're very big. Um, they kind of double the size of a projector. Uh, and they often need their own power because if you put a projector in a box, then it needs to be air conditioned. Um, uh, and there's, there's like a whole range of different kinds of enclosures out there of different beefiness and cost and such and and like if they're going to be out if there's going to be projectors that are outside during the daytime and they'll get hot um some some of these enclosures will like have an extra little sunshade and an air gap to keep it from just getting baked by the sun but if they're if that's not a concern then you can use less expensive ones so um without necessarily going into all the detail, detail right now i would say like researching and learning about projector enclosures and figuring out who on your team can be dealing with that is important and just to know that they are not a cheap thing um along with doubling the size of the projector it can double the cost of the, the rental depending on how, how serious those enclosures need to be uh, yeah and uh, security i think is another thing i would put out there for things to think about outside like um if you have equipment covering some area and that equipment either could be damaged by someone unintentionally or intentionally or could be stolen, then you have to figure out like, and it's in reach, like you have to figure out what your plan is for that. Um, and again, that may be something that the venue is gonna help you out with or it may not be. Um, and it can be something that, you, that needs to go into both your like personnel plans and your insurance plans. And if you're in a situation where you need to uh, put it away every night and then put it out again the next night, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. 
what kind of situation do you have in terms of being able to focus the projector uh, the projector when it's still daylight when you're setting up on your subsequent nights mm. so looking out for for that yeah i think too uh from my perspective of like the mapping uh, getting the right projectors and knowing the surfaces of everything you're projecting on i know that seems very much like oh i can you know be dark i know you know i'll put it up and it'll be fine it's five thousand lumens but you know that's not always the case um there's so many factors i mean are the keystoning available on that projector? Is it, you know, are they matching? Are they different? There's just all those type of nuances there um, that ideally would be assumed, but sometimes it's, you know, you can't get the same ones or, you know, there's a lot of different things. Um, obviously like that power scenario, I mean, depending on what it is um, and things I've done a lot of times is like generator based. So it's like a generator running all those projectors and like, that's a lot of work of setting that up one. It can be dangerous. Then setting up all the projectors and making sure all the converters working, all that stuff. I think to do it a, a good is like, you really need a good plan along with, you know, you're gonna create a good plan. If you're gonna do projection mapping, you have to do a lot of, you know, research of how to set that up. I think it goes the same way with like the, proper projector set up the surface the time of day you know are you ripping them down every night or are you leaving them there like the security factor is really important uh even the box that you like david was mentioning like those are all key factors there um i think kind of get overlooked when you think i can just go do it like we see things online and it's like oh that's projection mapped and it's like great but you didn't know that was on scaffolding and they're like 50 feet up or on another roof and you just kind of think you can you know uh, i just say because i've done that uh you know early on you're like oh i can go do this and then you go do it and you're like no i can't and you just kind of <laughs> you know you learn as you go through it but just like many of the you know topics we've talked about earlier is you know the workflow is really essential here to get it correct Yeah. Oh, but these are great questions. I would love to hear more, maybe in another time and space, about what exactly you're doing. It's intriguing. It's like, what project on a building? You're like, that's one thing, but it could be many different types of scenarios, like they're both saying. It's like, I don't know. Um, and the, what was the other thing that I was thinking oh, when you guys were talking, like learning even a rudimentary mentory um knowledge about electricity would be pretty important and high up on that list of like well how many how many watts is it pulling what kind of circuit do you have yeah, what is it a random amplitude? outlet on the side of the road i don't know <laughs> where is that coming from <laughs> like are you using a projector that's going to pull that or not like what's going on with that because it could be higher than you think over a longer term and you need to know the numbers before something just dies or kicks the circuit or whatever, you know, blows the circuit or something like that. Um, so that's the other level of intricacy. It was kind of mentioned, but I just wanted to put it in there too. Uh, no, I, I would just definitely second that. I mean, I've done shows where we have sh like had to stop performances because of that. Because, you, you know, you think, oh, we can plug these in, but some people, even if they have the electrical of the building, sometimes that's not always accurate too. So that's another factor as well that you may run into. And, and if you can ever get that information, that's going to be the best case scenario, if, if you can, because sometimes that's very difficult. You, I think that's a really good point. And, and, and often, if you're talking to people like you're talking to the electrician or the um, maintenance staff of a building or whoever is dealing with power, particularly if they don't deal with performances um, and things like that, they're going to ask you what uh, you need. And so um, all per like any projector, if you go find its specifications, it will tell you its electrical properties, like it will tell you how many volts and amps it needs. Um, and you can kind of add that stuff up and 
uh, have totals for folks and like any other things you're bringing like computers and all of that stuff. Generally, like if you can find the specification sheets, even if you don't know a lot about the details of electricity, um, you can find the place on it that gives you like the numbers and be like, well, this is what this thing says it is. And we have three of them. And then they'll, then the folks who are, you know, tasked with providing you that power will be like, okay, great. Then we're going to do these five things and we better do this. And, but that first question is going to be on whoever, you know, is planning what the projectors are. And I have one, maybe a final question or a direction for us to think about. And it has to do with the times we are living now and how the times are going to change in the future. And what, I mean, I'm not going to ask you to predict the future, but what are some things you as artists or practitioners or something have learned or not? That's fine if you haven't learned anything in, in, um, this digital time, digital time, like virtual time, I'm, I'm going to call it, that you wouldn't have learned if a pandemic didn't come and take over the world. Um, what are, and how do you think those relate to how we're going to think about theater or live performance in the future? Or not? I mean, I didn't really know a whole lot about streaming technology and integrating performance from multiple locations over the internet until the pandemic. And now I've, you know, done a bunch of those kinds of projects in different ways. Um, and I don't know, before, like, before the pandemic, like I had done work for things that were going to be streamed or going to be broadcast, but then they were like, they would generally be like a canned thing. Um, and now, and I didn't ever really have a particular interest, I thought, in like getting into live streaming stuff. Um, and there's this sort of, there's like half of the stuff during the pandemic and my experiences, but in things that I'm like, I don't really know if the, this is interesting. We're doing it this way because we have to. And then there's the other half of things where it's like, oh, we, we are doing some kind of cool thing that we wouldn't have tried otherwise. Um, and I'm interested to, you know, see what happens when people can be together in a theater again, like what, what's going to survive of this kind of work. Um, and I think something interesting has happened of like a lot of theater and live performance artists getting their hands on forms of delivering experiences that go outside of a traditional theater venue and therefore also audiences who might don't not go to the theater experiencing the work of those artists. And I think, I don't know, I think it's going to be important for us to like figure out, yeah, like to figure out what of that stuff is interesting enough to keep going with um uh on the on the other side of all of this kind of depends on who i think i mean who who gravitates that way and who wants to adapt and who wants to go back to the way we've been doing it before the pandemic um so i mean i think you're going to see branches uh, I think I think a lot of traditional theater will come back the way it was, and then a lot of it's gonna uh, kind of uh, go down a new road. And I I agree with that assessment as well. I, I think it's it's a divergent period uh, because of the force of the pandemic, and I think it's you know more people are aware of streaming more people are aware of like how to be empowered with technology to get their ideas out and i think that's going to be really important uh long term but i always and i do wonder and to david's point it's like what will it be like interpersonally when people are able to be around each other will people only be so used to what they have created or like their way of doing it and will it be harder for them to kind of bridge the gap or will people be just so excited to be together that they're willing to kind of go all in at that point I think there's a high potential of both but you know I think it'll be very situational and I think it's going to come down to you know empowering each other to to make that happen I think it's an exciting it's a it's an exciting time at the same time it's a, a a weird time if you look in history usually these type of weird times is when you get a lot more advancement there's a lot of people who have to work with the tools that they have 
and they have to push and try to get their idea out whatever way they can and without them realizing they are innovating by doing that and i think we'll look back on it and be like actually we did innovate so like all this streaming stuff this is innovative we may not think about it we're in the moment but if we look a couple years back we'll realize how much it, it may have changed everything we, we just don't know we're just living it so <laughs> When you're up, up, when you're up to your ass and alligators, it's kind of hard to remember you're here to drain the swamp. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. There's also, I mean, there's this question about like what is liveness, like uh, uh, that comes up in a lot of these conversations. And I mean, I don't know how many people in this group right now um, mostly focus on live performance versus do all kinds of different things. It seems like there's a pretty wide range. Um, I know for me, I was like most of the work I was doing came from live performance and um, yeah, we're sort of re re redefining what aspect of things is actually what is creating that. Um, and it was already the case that, you know, with projection in particular, you have a huge range of how live versus not live it is. The same way like music could be on a click track, it could be just conducted and the tempo might be different each night. It could be pre-recorded. Like, how live is the music, and does the audience know the difference? I think projection has often been the same way. It's like, are we gonna like busk it every night, and it's gonna look totally different? Is it gonna be completely planned out and run by a person who might as well be a computer? Is it gonna be one big long video that we have rehearsed to so perfectly that it looks like it's interactive, or is it gonna be like sensors that are responding to like where a dancer's arm is? And if the audience doesn't know and the experience is the same either way, does it matter which one it is other than your own kind of personal artistic satisfaction? So like these questions already came up for us in the kind of digital media production world. And now they've extended to like, if someone's going to dance on camera and they're doing it right now on the internet, does that make, is that better the version where you pre-recorded them and then did better compositing with a really cool, you know, 3D environment or I don't know, whatever you might have done. Like, what is it that is that makes an audience excited about what they're watching and what is it that makes you excited about what you're making? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think I, I think I have sort of less answers to that now than I did before the pandemic. I think it's, you know, the, the, it's gotten a lot muddier. I mean, it sort of doesn't, maybe it doesn't matter. Like it doesn't like make good work, but um, yeah, I guess there's a piece of it. There's also just like, what, where, where do you find the, the sort of artistic integrity and in what it is that you're creating and how does that relate to the medium that you're using and the tools you have available? Yeah, that, br that brings up a little, uh, some thoughts about um, now that things are streaming and you can actually stream a pre-recorded, you know, production or live production what happens when people are allowed in the theater again does your audience audience expand because now that you have to have basically a live studio broadcast in the theater like, is that actually going to be a thing like i was joking the other day but like that's what they do with sitcoms you know sitcoms are created that way you know, like live and there's people clapping and that created this energy for the people that were being recorded and now i could watch it in my living room and they were in ohio doing this and that created that magic in like the seventies, right? So, how does does that translate to an actual theatrical environment, mm. or will it, or will it be sacred and just closed like it was a closed environment, which you have to actually experience in real life? You know, and I think theaters, in, in terms of budgeting, it might be smarter for them to do it in some ways because then now they can reach other people in other places that they hadn't been able to reach before because it's physically possible possible to pre press play on a... Uh, yeah, but I think, I don't know, just like straight up putting a camera in the theater no. for a live performance is deadly, yeah. No, no I know, I know, but I was it's watching like, something yeah. on like, it was, um, I forget the show's name now, but it was a pre-recorded filmed live production and they had three cameras and they had a person switching the cameras and it was well done mm -hmm. and they, you know what i mean and it was actually i could 
watched the whole thing and it was 45 minute production and it was okay. Mm. It wasn't like just straight shot the whole time. Cause yeah, that's deadly. <laughs> like you can't do it. There were close ups, you know, the camera's moving, you know, you saw some of the audience, sometimes you didn't and it had a dynamic. So it was actually interesting. Now I rather be in the theater. I rather sit in the seat because it has that magic quality, but I, but as an alternative, if I couldn't go to New York that weekend, that would have been a cool thing to have, you know, like it's a cool experience to actually experience as an audience if I can't physically be present. Mm. I don't know, that's my own yeah. thing, but. Okay. So with that, does anybody have any other thoughts or questions out there in the in the people who are attending this <laughs> land? Um, okay, doesn't seem so. So I would like to thank all three of you for taking the time and engaging in this conversation. It was lovely and such a needed thing to do. Um, and I hope other people who are enjoying the the um, recording later or the streaming now appreciate it as well um so thank you very much everybody who's here tonight and tomorrow just a little plug i will be teaching a session on introduction to media servers Ooh, so exciting um primarily using isadora but also introducing like maybe obs can take care of some of your things if it's very simple and you are used to that or some other mechanisms to use um with that but it would be like a basic course especially for i mean i, I tend to have a lot of dance makers show up so dance makers you can come even if you don't like touching technology because i think it could be useful to integrate into just knowing what the heck is going on sometimes um yeah it's like a one-on-one -on -one course okay. Thank you so much, and I'm going to press the, the stop recording button. <laughs>